Hi, my name is Dominic Mohilo. We're here at the Serverless Architecture Conference 2019 and the API Conference 2019 in Berlin. With me is Jared Short, Senior Cloud Architect at Track 10. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Jared, in your keynote earlier, you spoke about the serverless mindset. So for starters, maybe you could please explain uh, what it means to have such a mindset. Yeah, so the, the serverless mindset or the serverless first mindset is how I try to approach uh, building new applications uh, in the cloud for our clients at Trek 10 and just in general, right? And it's, I've kind of isolated out this, this rule set or this process for how we do that approach and how we make sure that we're building the correct things that we should be building. And, and really it comes down to, to kind of four rules, right? Mm -hmm. So the first rule is if, if the platform has it, Uh, just use it, right? So if Amazon has a native service that does something that you need, don't build it yourself. It's just not worth doing. Uh, I'd rather use that managed platform service. Rule two is, well, okay, let's say Amazon doesn't have the service that we need, but maybe the market has it. So if the market has it, buy it. Usually it's going to be cheaper to, to buy something off the shelf and run it and assume that they can build and run it better if that's their business uh, magic, their special sauce, then, then you can build internally. And then uh, rule three uh, comes down to a lot of times when I'm working with clients, uh, they'll have kind of arbitrary business requirements that they've established, especially around things like latency or things like that, where they just arbitrarily picked a number and said, we have to have 50 millisecond latency. Well, What it comes down to is usually you can renegotiate those or, or as I like to say, uh, if you can reconsider those requirements, do it. It's, it's worth having a fight in, in the conference room mm -hmm. over what true latency requirements the business has. Like, I want to hear from a business stakeholder what their requirements are and you know, kind of current versus future uh, goals <clears throat> versus what the developer is telling me. Because you know, developers want Kubernetes or Kafka on their resume. The business holder cares if I deliver my actual system. So that's rule three. If, if you can reconsider requirements, do it. And then finally, rule four, and I think this is where it's really important in, in terms of serverless, is you know, if you have to build something, at that point, if the market didn't have it, if the platform didn't have it, if you've renegotiated requirements and you can't meet it and you have to build something, at that point, it's your special sauce. It's, it's your business value. It's what you're delivering to your end customers. So if you have to build it, I want you to absolutely own it. I want you to do the best possible thing you can. I, it's in worth investing developer time. It's worth making sure you have all of your pipelines in place, your testing and all of that. So that's kind of my four rules and my framework for the serverless first mindset. Okay. Um, serverless uh, is a highly debated topic. Sure. Um, so um, you say serverless is more than just function as a service. Um, what is serverless for you personally? For me personally, uh, <laughs> it, it's a paycheck. No. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I would say serverless in terms of how I view it is definitely not just functions as a service. I think that's a key component of it. Um, but really it's how do I deliver my business value to my end customers in a, in a way that I can mitigate the risk as much as possible in terms of building and delivering something. Um, and you can do that through platform services, right? Um, AWS AppSync, for example, offers a great GraphQL endpoint. Um, and I would rather use that than at this point build my own. And As long as I can mitigate risk and, and reduce my total cost of ownership wherever I can, I'm willing to spend a little bit more in terms of how much it might actually cost to leverage those services. Because I'm on the back end of that, I'm getting it back in terms of developer time from managing things. They can now be delivering actual business value and iterating on features. So serverless is, is that trade-off. I can trade off uh, paying a little bit more for managed services uh, in exchange for iterating faster with my developers on business value. Mm -hmm. um, security is always a big topic sure. in the DevOps universe and especially when it comes to cloud and co uh, container uh, development. Um, same goes for testing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, how has the serverless approach changed the way we <coughs> develop and test and, and, test. and, and uh, secure yeah. applications? This is, this is a fantastic question and something that I get a lot. Uh, and there's kind of this internal battle within the community of how much is worth testing locally versus how much, uh, since we're leveraging all these platform services mm. and we want to get the best out of uh, AWS or Azure or, or Google or any of these platforms that we're leveraging, 
you know, you're integrating so tightly with those platform services that really some of the value of testing is, well, we need to test the integration points between where my functions and my business logic is integrating with these services. So how much can I actually test locally, right? So I still think there's a lot of value in testing your business logic as much as possible in terms of unit testing, right? Does the, th the function actually do what I think it does in terms of uh, the actual unit? But a lot of the value of, of testing and security and all of that moves into looking at your actual integration points in those, those native services, those platform services, and saying, are my IAM policies as locked down as possible based on what actually running this thing in the cloud is telling me, right? I can say, is this APIs that I, I believe are getting used actually being used? If not, can I restrict that IAM policy? So it's much more about evaluating your actual stance in the cloud and, and evaluating based on real runtimes what things are doing in terms of security or um, testing and, and make sure that you're doing a full, cohesive, uh, comprehensive testing and security strategy even in the cloud, right? So it's, you can't just do it locally anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's where it's changed a lot. Okay, um, so Knative is another big topic in the sure. serverless world right now. Um, <clears throat> do you think that Knative will become the standard for developing container applications in the serverless context? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, so interestingly, I think Knative was poorly marketed. Uh, and the reason I'm gonna say that <laughs> is because instead of calling it serverless, I just would have called it the opinionated way you should have done Kubernetes, like you should do Kubernetes, mm -hmm. right? So what it establishes is a set of guidelines and opinions and, and rules really for how you leverage a Kubernetes cluster. So yes, it's kind of serverless in that I, as an application developer, can hand it a container, give it some small config, and then behind the scenes, it does all of these best practices around scaling and security and things like that. And I think Knative, It's fantastic for the container and Kubernetes community in that it establishes those guidelines. Would I call it serverless? I don't know. Uh, and I think, <laughs> frankly, that made more people angry that it was called serverless than if they had just said, this is the way like, developers should be leveraging Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Knative in establishing that, that baseline did a very good job in doing so. Um, so I'm excited to see where that project goes. I think it if nothing else, will drive the conversation more towards how developers should be leveraging Kubernetes, right? If you're going to pay the people to manage your Kubernetes cluster, awesome. If you have that money on hand, that's fantastic. But let's make sure developers have an easier experience uh, in Kubernetes where we can. So yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic tool. And I think it was much needed by the community. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to see where it goes. OK, and where it goes, that's the next question. <laughs> um, serverless. 2020 and beyond, oh what, boy. what do you think the future of serverless will look like? I think we are going to see many more applications for serverless become viable, right? So right now, actually, I would have said up until about a week ago, uh, it would have been difficult to do things like video encoding or things like that. It's kind of stateful. Uh, stateful applications or things that you want highly parallel and, and kind of sequence or things like that um, is, is difficult to do in serverless. Now, a week ago, somebody actually introduced the fastest video encoder possible, like that exists on the planet, mm -hmm. built on AWS Lambda, uh, where they essentially construct a mini supercomputer mm -hmm. inside of Lambda, right? So even as I speak and have these examples, um, It's quickly becoming possible to do these things in, in serverless, uh, in Lambda, Knative, things like that. So I think what we're going to see uh, 2020 and beyond is a couple things. One, we're going to see a lot more uh, native event-based systems. I think a lot of SaaS integrators are going to start exposing, uh, instead of webhooks, events. Uh, we see this with Amazon EventBridge um, becoming uh, publicly available now. So uh, Zendesk and others are publishing events, so you don't have to have webhooks. So I think that'll be a big part of it. And then I think we're just going to see more and more use cases become viable with serverless at the edge, making it much faster to communicate uh, with those functions at the edge. Um, uh, IoT applications will become much more prevalent. Um, doing video and stateful things in, in serverless and functions will, will be much more available. And then I think just moving up the stack, we're going to see more and more managed services solving common problems. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's where our value really lies is you know, handing off some of those complex tasks, just saying, yeah, sure, I'll let Amazon or Google yeah. or whoever handle those for me. All right. Then thank you, Jared. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Thank you.